this. Yep, you're good. All yeah. right, I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Sounds good. So like I said, I'm Andrew Cochran. I'm going to talk to you guys today about chemistry and nanofabrication and nanotechnology. So start off with a little bit about me. Like Mr. Heller said, I took this class when I was back in school. Uh, that was actually most of my chemistry class that I was friends with when I was in this class. Is that a picture of me? That's a picture of Mr. Heller. I was actually sitting like right over there. And uh, yeah, I got the yellow sheet out. I got the blue sheet. So, And then... Uh, yeah, that was my high school tennis team. Uh, I also swam here when I was in school, so had a great time at Worcester. Um, after that, I just want to go a little bit through my career path, because when I was in your seats, um, I liked chemistry, but I really didn't think I wanted to be a chemist and sit in a lab all day. Um, and so I really didn't think I was going to use chemistry again, and I feel like some of you probably can relate to that. So. When I was in high school, uh, I took this class in 2016. I actually took it again in 2017. Um, don't, don't worry about that. Um, but at the time, I thought I wanted to be like a chef. I thought I wanted to be a food scientist, um, maybe work in agriculture like my family did, probably go to Ohio State. Um, so that's kind of where my mind was at. And I was like, OK, that's what I'm going to do. I graduated in 2018, and I started working at Scheffler Automotive um, when I was just out of high school. And I decided to go to Ohio Northern University, play tennis there, and I started in mechanical engineering. So I went from chef to now mechanical engineering. Um, from there, um, I worked at Scheffler, and then I went over to Marathon Petroleum. I worked there. I worked on testing their pipelines. Uh, they send a bunch of robots through their pipelines to check them for cracks and dents and things. And I took a circuits class, and I really liked it, so I switched to electrical engineering. So this is like halfway through college already, and I'm switching majors. So after that, I went and worked at Artiflex, which some of you might know. And I also moved out to Idaho um, before my senior year at college and worked at Idaho National Lab. It's where the Navy does all their nuclear reactors. So I worked out there for a summer. Then I went and worked for a fiber optics company. I designed internet service for people. And then now I'm at Carnegie Mellon University for grad school. Never really thought I'd go to grad school. And I do chemistry on a regular basis. I wear a bunny suit. I work in a clean room that is like no particles. There's no dust in the room. So that's what I do. So at any point, you guys can ask me questions about these things. Uh, and we'll have more time at the end, too. So. Yes? What was your favorite lab that you did in this class? Um, definitely like the mixing chemicals one was fun. Is that the one we just I think that's, that one's a good one. Um, I think I liked anything we were heating stuff up, you know, get the Bunsen burners going and stuff. So I think those are fun. So um, today we're going to talk about what makes up a computer chip. Does anyone know what the fundamental component of a computer chip is? Silicon's what it's made of. Now, what is actually the device that's on a computer chip? There's tons of them. <coughs> All right, it's actually uh, a switch. So computers are just made up of bunches of switches. That's pretty much what drives our everyday life. So you can imagine, right, the most basic computer is I turn the switch on, the light bulb turns on. I switch the light off, the light goes off. And you can imagine you can do some more things if you put a couple together. So you probably all have some light switch in your house that has two switches for one light bulb, right? And depending on the way you switch one on or off, you can get different mathematical operations, actually. So these are like the basic building blocks. And then we just put more and more of these switches together. And eventually, you get a computer. So what is nanotechnology? Well, this is what a typical wafer looks like. So we start out with a wafer after we're done manufacturing. It's about the size of a dinner plate. And on each of these wafers, there's about 600 um, computer chips, or we call them dies as well. And they're about the size of your fingernail. So that's about the typical size of a computer chip. And then within each one of these computer chips, there's about a billion or more switches. So on your fingernail, there is a billion or 100 billion switches. And they're about 5 nanometers is the minimum feature size. And so the minimum dimension is about 50 atoms wide. So that's pretty much the smallest switch we can make at the moment. And that's what's in your computer chip. That's what's on your fingernail. 
So how do you fabricate a computer chip, right? So we have all these computer chips, like how do you actually build one? So it's a layer by layer process, and there's three basic steps, and they're pretty simple. First one, we can add material to this wafer. The second one is we can pattern it. We can make it different shapes. And the third one is we remove some of that material. And those are pretty much the three steps of the process. And you just repeat them hundreds of times. And then eventually you get a computer chip. So it's pretty simple, right? So. <laughs> All right, so now you're wondering, OK, how is chemistry involved in all this? What could I actually do with this? Maybe I'm interested in computer chips. So these are some different jobs that use chemistry in a nanofabrication. The first is a chemical engineer. So a chemical engineer basically takes what you're doing now and says, OK, how do we do this in the real world? How do we use these chemical reactions to actually make something useful? So they do things like develop the process, how you actually mix the chemicals, what things you do. They look at simulations of how the chemicals interact and also physical pro uh, processes, how things move around. And they work on a lot of the conditions and controls. So what temperature you would do them at, what pressure, et cetera. Other one is material scientists. And you might wonder, like, what are they doing? Uh, these people study material properties. Uh, it's kind of started as a branch of chemistry. And they do things like uh, characterize different materials. So you know, some materials conduct electricity. Some are insulating. Some are bending. Some are not. Uh, and they also study these under like microscopes, so advanced microscopes where you can see down to these five nanometer dimensions or even single atoms. And they also study things like how do these switches actually work, right? So a light switch is pretty simple. You guys can probably figure that one out. But once you make them five nanometers, how is that thing actually switching? Another one is mechanical engineer. This is what I started in. Um, they're going to do more of like the automation and controls in the, found, in the factory. Um, so how you move these wafers around, how you handle them, stuff like that. They also work a lot on thermodynamics, which you guys will study some in this class. So PV equals NRT, something you'll learn later if you haven't already, as well as fluid dynamics. And then, right, so I have a wafer, I have a chip. How do I put it in a phone, right? We can't just like throw it in there, right? So you have to connect to it. You've got to package it up. And the last one, obviously, the best choice is uh, electrical engineers. Um, so we do the fun stuff. So we actually design the circuits using these switches. We design the actual switch, so the device physics. And we also work on, OK, this is all great. We can build a computer chip. But how do we actually make it useful? How do we put all these steps together? So. That's uh, one of the, the areas that I'm really interested in. So, OK, I told you there's three steps. And we're going to pretty much go over these for the bulk of the rest of the time. So how do you add material? How do you pattern material? How do you remove it? So we'll start with, how do you add something? And I have a question for you guys. How would you add material to a wafer? I need like five volunteers for this. So. You guys are going to have to come up with some answers. What would you do? Oh, um, probably like, I don't know, like glue or solder it on Glue, solder, like it? I think you like engrave it. Engrave it. So we're just talking about first putting the material on there. Oh, what do you mean? How would I add? So I have, I have a wafer. <coughs> this is pure silicon right here. It's like 100% pure silicon. So how would I add something? What, do, what would you say? Uh, how are you going to layer it on? You just glue it with like gorilla glue. Glue it on? Yeah, gorilla. And then I'm assuming like you use like something yeah, like heat. Heat, totally heat it up. Melt it down and put it on there, right? So we could melt some gold and dip this thing in gold, right? Yeah. That'd be one way. Yeah. How else? What if I want to make this wafer red? What would you guys do? Paint it. Paint it. Spray it on, right? Yeah, we can use some spray paint. We can get them all glittery, right? Shiny. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like a decent idea, right? Yeah. So that's pretty much actually what we do. First thing we do is we melt things down, we evaporate them. The next one is we spray it on, I mean, like a paint can, not actually, but kind of. And the third way, you guys all should have gotten this, chemical reaction, guys. Come on, we're in chemistry class, right? So, so we're going to go over these, these three methods for how you add material. So first one, how would you evaporate a material? Go get it. You heat it up, right? All the way, OK? So that's pretty much what we do. Instead of just heating it up, though, we actually use a beam of electrons. Because to melt gold and get it to evaporate, you've got to get it pretty hot, right? 
So instead, we actually take a beam of electrons. And it's kind of cool. When you heat up a piece of wire, it just like generates electrons. And you can actually steer this beam of electrons up and around, and it comes crashing down into the metal or whatever you're trying to evaporate. And so the metal melts here, and it evaporates up. And then it comes up and evaporates, and it condenses on your substrate. Yeah. How, did, how did they figure out that you could just like bend a piece of metal and it's going to shoot electrons at it? Um, like they tried it. So there's a lot of experiments, and that's pretty much the fundamental way you can generate just electrons. A beam of electrons is heating stuff up. So that's the first way. Now, there's a problem, though, right? I told you we have to get it really hot. We have to add a lot of energy. So how do you make things evaporate? How do you think make things boil at lower temperatures? Yeah? Less pressure, right? We do it up in the atmosphere, right? So we do it at low pressure. So a big part of fabricating these computer chips is actually they all have to be done under vacuum. And so for here as an example, I know you guys don't work in TOR. So atmospheric press pressure is about 760 TOR. And we are down to 3.6 times 10 to the minus 7, or even minus 8, or minus 9. So there's basically only a few molecules in this chamber. And the reason is, I told you these guys are 50 nanometers wide, right? So if I just throw in one extra atom of something random, you know, that's like 2%. You know, I throw five extra atoms, that's 10%, right? So it's got to be completely pure inside. The other problem is, right, we know PV equals NRT, right? So if I have high pressure, I have a lot of moles, which means a lot of particles, right? If I have low pressure, I have a lot less of these. So you can imagine, if I'm trying to shoot atoms upwards, right, there's a bunch of particles in there. They're just going to run into everything. It's not going to go in a straight line. It's not going to ever get there. So that's why we have to do everything at vacuum. Uh, and so there's a few ways we do this. One is, you know, a standard pump. Um, this is just going to pump all the gas out of there mechanically. And another kind of cool one is we use these cryo pumps. So these are actually all pictures from my lab that I work in. So this is a cryogenic pump. Basically, it just freezes the particles out of the air. Because we see if we go to really low temperature, we get really low pressure as well. How low temperature do you get in uh, it's down to a few Kelvin, so I don't know exactly what these ones are rated for, but usually cryo temperatures are down that way. So. What happened if like a human was in that? Did you just, like, oh, kind of trouble? Trouble? Did you just, like, Yeah, so there's kind of a problem with that, right? So yeah. the reason we have to do a few things, not actually humans, but similar to what you're thinking about, right? So you'd think, okay, we got this cool thing that just freezes everything out. Like, let's just hook that up and pump it all the way down, right? The problem is, what's in the air, right? What's in the air? Water, right? So if I just hook the air directly into this, right, I'm just going to get a huge ice cube in here. And we call that dumping a cryo pump. So if you just hook this thing up to the air, it just creates a huge ice block, and then this thing doesn't work anymore. So we actually have to pump it out mechanically first to get rid of most of the air. And then we move on to the cryo pump. I don't think you can fit in that box. It's a it's a pretty small box. I I think you would die. Yes. So another way we can do it um, is so I told you we have this energy problem, right? We got to heat this thing up a lot. Um, what is another way we can add energy into the system? Motion. Motion. Okay. I think maybe we could do a little bit of that. So like some ultrasonic shaking. Sometimes we can do that to do things. Uh, any other ideas? What other forms of energy are there? Heat. Heat. Yeah, we've done that one. Anything else? Chemical. Chemical light. OK, so this is actually a different form of matter. And this is called plasma. So plasma, does anyone know what plasma is? Yeah, but like I couldn't describe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just like, that's like another state of matter. Okay, and what? All right, so we got gas, it's free flowing. It, I just describe it. I know it's like. All right, so a plasma is basically you take a gas and you strip the atoms away from the electrons. So now we have positive ions. These atoms are positively charged, and we have electrons that are negatively charged. And this can 
uh, create extra energy. And so we call this process sputtering. And so what we do is we generate a plasma and we create these argon ions and we accelerate them down towards the metal we want to deposit. In this case, alumina is what we are depositing. So we accelerate them down, they collide with the alumina, and they knock them off and give them energy that shoots them up to the top. So this is a picture inside one of our tools. And so you can see up here, there's some little chips that we're depositing on. So we shoot down argon and we get off the metal. This allows you to do it at much lower temperatures, actually gives you better control, and that way we can deposit other materials that we can't easily evaporate. And so it's great, you can deposit a metal. Now what if I want to deposit an alloy or you know, a dielectric material? How do we do that? There's a few different ways. So the first one is we directly, we, instead of using metal, we use a compound here. So you start with a compound, you knock off the compound, it all lands on the top. The second way is we do co-sputtering. So sometimes we want to deposit two metals at once. We'll actually have two different metal sources and we'll deposit them at the same time. And then they just kind of mix together, which is fun. And there's another way, which is the chemical way, and that's to use reactive sputtering. So an example is silicon and nitrogen. So we make silicon nitride. Um, and that is a dielectric, that's an insulating material. So we actually deposit silicon and then we introduce nitrogen gas. And then when you apply some extra energy, a reaction occurs and we form silicon nitride. Another way we can do it, we said we can do it by a, a chemical process. So what does that look like? Well, we create a chemical reaction. And so this is a, an example of a, a chemical vapor deposition tool. And there's a few different processes we can do. So the first one is we can deposit silicon, which you all heard is, you know, the big one. And then I talked about silicon nitride and also silicon oxide, which is another dielectric. So, quick pop quiz question. What type of reaction is the first equation? Decomposition, right? So we start with one and we split it into two. The second one, we're forming silicon nitrate. What kind of reaction is that? Double. Double displacement, right? We take the nitrogen from this side, throw it with silicon, and then we actually get, you know, HCl, acid as a byproduct, and some hydrogen gas. And the third one? Still double displacement. It's a weird form, right, because we kind of split these up in the end. And you'll notice, okay, that in this case, we actually use reactants as gases. So you've kind of seen this in your homework problems, like people mixing gases and liquids and things. And you're like, okay, when does that actually happen? Well, this is actually when we do it. So we take the two gases together, and we end up with a solid. Um, but again, you can see here, right, we're getting up to 900 C, and that's going to get pretty hot. And sometimes that's not compatible with the other steps of the process we want to do. So how do we lower the temperature down? We could do vacuum, right? But we also have to flow in these gases. So when we add gas in, that's going to increase the pressure. Any other ideas? How can we add energy? What did we just do to add energy? Plasma. We get our old friend. So we call this a plasma-enhanced chemical vapor deposition. So pretty much most you know, fabrication processes, they have a version that involves plasma. Because it's just a good way to add energy controllably. All right, now we're going to go over one more way. And I think this is probably one of the coolest ones for chemical deposition. Um, how would you deposit something really thin, right? So I can create a reaction. I can deposit some materials. Now let's say I just wanted to make it one atom thick, one layer of atoms thick. What would you have to do? All right, if I want to deposit something really thick, what would you do? A lot more and a long time, right? You just let it deposit forever and you just keep getting a huge stack. So if I want to make it really thin, what do I do? Do really fast or you limit the inputs too, right? So I could limit the limiting reactant, and I could do it slower. 
The problem is, is when you try to do things really fast, really short, really small amounts, uh, it's not very consistent, right? If I got to shut it off really fast, that's hard. Or you might not get it even everywhere. It might be kind of splotchy. So instead, what we can do is we actually take advantage of these limiting reactants in a chemical process. So this is how it works. We start with a silicon wafer. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to introduce some water with some heat. Okay? And that's going to form this hydroxyl group, it's called. It's an oxygen and a hydrogen, and that bonds to the silicon. So that only can react with the surface, right? Because underneath it, it's all blocked. So it just get a hydroxyl group on our surface. After that, we add in this fancy precursor. Basically, all it is is a methyl group, and you'll learn about it maybe a little later, with aluminum. It's basically just aluminum with some extra stuff that we're going to use. And what's going to happen is this methyl group is going to react with these hydroxyl groups. And now I have my oxygen connected to my aluminum. And so this is the chemical reaction, if you want to look at it. All right, so now it's reacted with that surface. So in this case, what do you think the limiting reactant is going to be? The hydroxyl group or this gas that we pumped in? The hydroxyl group, right? Because it's only along the surface. So we pump it all the way in, and we react all of them. And then we can pump out all the excess. Right? So now we have a uniform layer, just one layer all the way across. Okay? So now I'm going to add in water again. Okay? So now I'm going to react to the water with the hydroxyl group again, or with the methyl group. What do you think is going to be the limiting reactant here? The water or the aluminum? The aluminum, right? Because there's only one layer of them. So we do that, and they bond off again. And then again, we pump out all the excess products. And as a result, we get a layer that's one atomic layer thick. And this is pretty much the gold standard for how we deposit these really thin films in industry. OK, what's the point of really? Like, I know that there's obviously like stuff that does, but like, what is the point of something that that's, that's that tiny and that minuscule? Like, like, what is that? For? Right. So if I make my switch is huge, right? It's the size of a light switch, right? I can get zero of them on my computer chip, right? If so I this is, so this is making the switch. This isn't just like so. These are really like all the switches for the unit. No, so a switch has three components, right? We need something that conducts the electricity, right? Mm -hmm. Something has to let it go through, right? We got to have a layer that insulates the wire, right? And then we have to have something to turn it off, right? <coughs> turn it on and off again, right? So our metals, or our silicon actually, is usually our conductive material. So we make the silicon conductive. Then we need an insulating material. Aluminum oxide could be an in example of an insulating material. And then the third one is a way to switch it on and off, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So um, basically, you need to add these different materials. The specific reasons why, if you're interested in, Go study them in college. That's pretty much the best advice I can give right now without getting too in the weeds. Or go search it on the internet. There's uh, one that's called Silicon Run on YouTube. It's like an hour long, and it goes through actually an industrial process of how this works. So if you're interested in that, um, feel free to reach out. So, OK, so we figured out we can add some material on, and that's cool. How would you change the properties of that material? How would you change the properties of a glass of water? Adding or taking heat. Adding what? Adding or taking away. Adding or taking away heat. Changing the temperature. What else can we do to water? Can mix other stuff? We can mix some stuff in it. Okay. Right. So that's a few of the things we can do. Right. So we can change the temperature. We could have it react with something, or we can just stir something in, dissolve something in, right? And so those are three ways we actually do it for our process. So the first one I'm going to talk about is ice cubes, right? So you guys have seen this before, right? Sometimes the ice is clear, and sometimes it's white, right? Everyone's yeah. seen this before. Oh, yeah. This one's nice and soft. You know, it's easy to chew, and this one, like, will break your teeth, right, if you chomp down on it, right? So. There's two different properties here. So how do we get the two? Well, 
there's clear ice, and this is actually a single cube of ice. It's all one cube. You know, it's perfectly frozen. If we want the top one, right, we got to get a bunch of tiny little ice cubes and air bubbles frozen together, right? If you take an ice cube and you throw it in water and freeze it again, now you have an ice cube inside of an ice cube, right? And so what we call this actually is single crystals and polycrystals, right? So a single crystal is made up of one ice cube. It's all one. It's perfectly aligned together. Uh, a polycrystal is more loosely aligned. There's little crystals together that are all kind of smushed together. So there's two different things we can do with that. So a single crystal of silicon, what you have to do is you got to heat it up till it melts, and then you got to cool it down really slowly so it freezes all together. And when you do this, silicon is a perfect insulator. It conducts no electricity. Now instead, if you, you heat up it and you cool it down super quickly, right? Like if you freeze ice super quickly, it cracks and it gets white and it changes shape. And actually in this case, it becomes more conductive to electricity. So just by heating up and cooling things down, different rates, different processes, we can create and change the properties of materials. The next one is uh, oxidation, right? So everyone's seen pennies before. For some reason they turn green after a while because they react with oxygen in the air. So we can do a similar thing with silicon, right? So if we want to make silicon dioxide, which is an insulator, we just need to add oxygen. And to do this, we have to do this at high temperatures and create an insulator. So we got a little math problem for you guys today. You guys get to apply a little bit of what you guys learned in this class to my real life, right? So you guys might say, all right, well, this is, you know, I can convert some things. This is actually still probably the most used thing from this class I learned. So the way you guys learn to solve these problems is the number one. So if I'm creating one nanometer of silicon dioxide, how many nanometers of silicon is going to be consumed? Does anyone have a guess of where to start this problem? We're going to be doing dimensional analysis like you guys have done before. So what? Start with the silicon dioxide, right? All right, so we got, we're going to say one nanometer of SiO2, OK? What's next? What do I got to do next? nanometers in the mole. In the mole, okay, right? So I know how to get to grams if I have cubic centimeters, right? So how do I get nanometers, which is a thickness, to centimeters cubed, which is a volume? If I, if I know the thickness of a material, right? What do I need to know to calculate the volume, right? The area. The area, right? Oh, yeah. I didn't give you an area, right? Which is okay. We just get to assume whatever we want here. Because the area is the same for this one as it is for this one over here. So we're just going to assume the area is such that one nanometer times the area is equal to one centimeter cubed. Right? And that'll make our lives a whole lot easier, right? So we come here, we say one nanometer is equal to one centimeter cubed, right? And this is SiO2. All right, now what do I need to do next? I got my volume of silicon dioxide. Make, make it into the um, grams per centimeter. The grams, right? <laughs> so I know one centimeter cubed, SiO2, is equal to 2.65 grams, right? All right, now what do I need to do next? I'm in grams. You guys are happy now, right? Get to moles. How do we get SiO2 moles or grams to moles? Okay, and what is the atomic mass of SiO2? 28 is silicon? 60.084. And we say that is what? One mole. One mole of SiO2. Okay? Now I want to get the moles of silicon. How do I do that? Mole ratio. What's our mole ratio here? One to one. One to one, right? One mole <laughs> SiO2 is equal to one mole of silicon. 
And now where do I go? One mole of silicon is equal to how many grams? 28. Right, we'll get to the mass in a minute, man. Right, so 28 about, right? And then we know the grams of silicon is how many? 2.33 grams silicon, and that gives us one centimeter cubed, right? Now I need to get to nanometers. How do we get to nanometers? Just say it's one to one, right? Because we get to cheat a little bit, right? So, and that gives us to one nanometer of silicon, okay? And that's exactly what we did, okay? You do the whole process, and then you would solve that equation. And it turns out that you're going to consume 0.53 nanometers of silicon for every nanometer of SiO2. Um, turns out math doesn't always work out, and in the real world, it actually consumes 46%. So 0.46 nanometers per nanometer. So... Um, that's just kind of life, I guess. So. Didn't that feel like a homework problem? All right. So the next one we're gonna move on to is doping, which is a big scandal in the U.S., right? So no, I'm just kidding. But um, why are metals conductive? Why do they collect conduct electricity? Does anyone have any ideas? Yeah. Nice, like interior crystal structure is able to like the electrons can transfer. Okay, so the electrons can move, right? Yeah. They're yeah. free to move around, right? So metals have what we call free electrons. And that allows them to conduct electricity. So how do I make silicon, which we said single crystal silicon is not conductive? How would I make it conductive? What do I need to do? We add some electrons, right? And that's exactly what we do. We add them in. And so what we can do is we see silicon up there, right? It's in the fourth column, right? So it's four electrons. So if I want to add an electron, I just need to add in a material from the fifth column. So I add in something like phosphorus or arsenide. Or, and as a result, we now have an extra electron in the structure. And so that allows us to control the conductivity of these materials. Ooh. And how you do this, um, there's a few different ways. You can either just put a layer of that material on top in some glass. You heat it up, and they'll actually just sink down into the material. They'll diffuse into it. The other way is actually you can kind of shoot those ions down, kind of like the sputtering process we did before. Now you actually implant those using by accelerating them with some energy. And then oftentimes, after we do that, we get like one line of those ions. And so oftentimes, we want to spread it out so it's more uniform. To do that, you just heat it up. And that's how we do it. So this is actually a huge part of the industry. And that's how we make our switch somewhat conductive. All right, so we did all that. And now we have one layer of material on our substrate, right? There's three different ways we could deposit it. And we could modify it a little bit. But so far, we just have one layer. So I'm going to pass around a couple samples. Um, weird rule, lefty tidy, righty loosey, OK? So someone left-handed definitely invented this, but sorry. Um, so this is a silicon wafer. The first one, it says silicon on it. Next one is silicon. And then we have sputtered a layer of aluminum nitride, which is another dielectric material. So. Pass these around. You can take a look. Uh, try not to drop them. So have fun with those. OK, next step up. So we've added a material. Now we need to pattern it, right? It's, we, we don't just want a sheet of metal, right? That's Anybody can have a sheet of metal. So we've got to pattern it. We've got to change it into different shapes. So how would you pattern a wafer? You draw on it, OK? <laughs> right? How else would you do it? How else could I get my pattern on this way? A mold. A mold, yeah? OK. Any other ideas? If I gave you to this to you and I said, take it home, put a pattern on it, what, what, what could you do? Engrave it, yeah? You could 3D print on it, right? All right, so that's pretty much what we do. The first option. Actually, the industry sten standard is to use stencils. 
We use stencils. We create fancy stencils and we do it that way. You can do things that are similar to 3D printing and laser cutting. Um, these are more for like prototyping and research labs. So in my lab, I use one that's kind of like a 3D printer or a laser cutter. So we're going to go through lithography. And so lithography is using stencils to pattern things using light. So we have this material we just deposited. And what we're going to do is we're going to add a layer of polymer on top. So like a plasticky or an epoxy kind of substance. And then we're going to put this stencil over top. Okay, so I have two pieces of metal and a slit in between, right? And then I, if I use a light source and I expose this to light, right, the light only comes through that slit. And so then this light interacts with the polymer and it changes the properties of the material. So then if I add another chemical here, I put the material in a chemical. I actually can dissolve away the part that I just exposed. And now I can create a hole in this polymer. So this allows us to pattern our material. So first thing we got to do is we got to add this polymer on. Polymer is pretty much glorified nail polish. Okay? So what we do to get an even coating, right? you can brush it on your nails. Um, actually, the most even way to do it is we pour some on and then we spin it super fast and then just a perfectly thin even layer is on top of it and so this is the next sample this is once I've spun on some photoresist uh, you can actually see I didn't do a perfect job there's a corner missing so you can have that on there. so yeah so basically to do this right if I wanted to put on a polymer I cannot just like put a hard polymer on there right I need it in a liquid form so I can pour it on just like nail polish right so basically, this polymer we have, or the solution, we have two things. We have the solute and the solvent. So the solute, in this case, is the polymer as well as some light sensitive material. The solvent, in this case, is some form of acetate, um, which you might hear that's similar to acetone. So acetone is nail polish remover. It also is what we use to remove this polymer when we're done with the process. So. We'd spin it about 5,000 RPMs, so you can imagine your car tires going around 5,000 RPMs. That's how fast we spin these things around. And then we want to bake off all that solvent, so now we just have a layer of the polymer. It's kind of like what you do with the nail polish. You let it dry or you, you know, cure it under UV. All right, so the next thing is we need to have a stencil. So these are what we call masks. Um, this is a pretty cheap mask. This is about $1,000 mask. Um, in industry, these are millions of dollars for a single mask. So this is the most expensive product of the process. The, the light source that we use is the most expensive piece of a foundry. They can go close to a billion dollars just for the one tool. So you hear, you know, they're building an $8 billion plant. Probably one billion of that is just for one of the tools, the tool that exposes it to light. So this is a mask. It's a stencil, and there's two main components here. We have chrome usually is what's used to block the light, so you can see it's nice and shiny. And then we have glass where the light can pass through. So you can pass this around, have a look at it. All these samples are old samples, so don't drop them. But if you do, it won't be the end of the world. Don't worry. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can see these patterns are large, like you can still see them, right? So when we actually do this, we use magnifying, we use as lenses and objectives to shrink them all down. And each of these masks is just going to be for one centimeter square in the end. So you're going to take this whole thing and shrink it down to that point. So a mask is about six inches by six inches roughly, and then our chip is one centimeter by one centimeter. So we shrink all that down a ton. And you might notice, you yeah, know, this picture is like all yellow. So this, this material is sensitive to light, right? And it's specifically <coughs> sensitive to UV light. And UV is actually part of what makes these lights white. So we actually have to filter out all the UV. So you stand in these rooms and they're just yellow all the time because all the white light is missing, uh, or the UV. So it doesn't hurt your eyes after a while. It doesn't hurt your eyes, but you like. Your gloves, like I wear blue gloves, right? And the white light, they look nice and pretty. And the yellow light, they just look dark, you know, and boring. And I'm like, 
why are the gloves so much worse in here, you know? And then I realized they're actually the same gloves, but I just, you know, was in a different part of the room. So, all right, the next part is we got to develop it. So, we, it, when it, we expose it to UV, a few things can happen. So, there's two kinds. So, one kind is when we expose it to light, it weakens the material. And this actually happens because we create an acid in the reaction. So, you don't need to worry about a lot of what's going on here. But I start with some material, I add in some energy, some light, and I end up with <coughs> hydrogen ions, which is what makes things acidic. And that's probably something you'll learn later if you haven't already. Uh, and basically, that just weakens the structure. But as a result, acids can be dissolved in bases. So when I do that process, I expose it, I create some acidic material. When I stick the chip in a basic solution, it removes and it dissolves that material away. The other option is I can use a negative resist, and this is more like nail polish. If you have UV nail polish, you expose it to light, it becomes hardened. And so basically, you break some bonds here, and that allows the whole thing, these whole chains to bond together. And so that creates that material really hard. So then I just dissolve away the other material that's just weakened using some sort of a <laughs> solvent in that case. Okay, so we've added material, we've patterned it. Uh, this is one more. This is an example, this is one of my lab mates. He works on these uh, neural, neural devices, and so these are the devices after, it's with the same polymer, just after we've exposed it to light and put it in the, the basic solution. So those are there for you guys to see. All right, so we've added a pattern, okay, but I don't just want polymer patterns, right? I want to make metal patterns, make silicon patterns. So how do we do that? Well, we got to remove some material. So how would you remove material from the wafer? Dissolve it, okay. Laser cutting it. Any other ideas? Scrape it off. Physically remove it. So like after you expose it to the light thing to make the pattern to get like the pattern away. Uh, we, so we create holes, right? So I have different holes, right? So actually we use the polymer as a protective layer. So everywhere the polymer is, nothing happens, right? It just eats up the polymer. Where there's no polymer, then we can attack that material. What other way? I need one more. Someone's got to get this answer today. What other way? We can use physical removing. We could laser cut it. What other way? Come on. Burn it off. Okay, I need one more. Plasma. Plasma, yes, we could do that. And one more. Put in the dark. What class are we in, guys? Come on. Yeah, chemical, reaction. chemical reaction, okay? So that's what we do. So we do chemical remove. The two ways are pretty much a chemical removal or a physical removal. So this is a picture of the lab I work in, and this is where we handle all the acids and bases to do this dissolving process. Um, so you see it looks a little different than your lab, right? So. We do these in fume hoods because a lot of these acids and bases we use are toxic and dangerous to you. And so we actually need the exhaust to pull them away, right? We use like 100% purity acids at times. So uh, they can be quite dangerous. And so I have to wear a bunch of PPE. I wear really long gloves. I wear aprons. I wear face shields. Um, and I work in these benches. So. An example of one reaction you can do is using hydrofluoric acid. And hydrofluoric acid is pretty dangerous. If you spill it on yourself and goes untreated, you can die pretty quickly. So, but it's really good at dissolving glass or silicon dioxide. And so when you mix silicon dioxide with hydrofluoric acid, then as byproducts you get water and another ion solution. Um, a few differences between what you guys do and what we do, right? So in you guys, you just kind of mix it together. For us, it's really important how fast that reaction occurs, right? And it's not always just limited by the <coughs> chemistry. It also can be limited by physical processes. So how fast you replenish that solution, how fast the ions can get in and out to react. The other one we care about is the profile, right? What shape does it make when it reacts? Is it straight? Is it curved? And um, so there's a few different processes that we can do. So the first one is physical removal. And we're going to call on our old friend plasma, right? <laughs> so we have these ions, right? We can bombard them at the material. 
So just like sputtering, right? Sputtering, we directed them at my sheet of metal, my cup of metal that I needed to deposit. In this case, I just direct it at my substrate, and I bombard it with different ions. And as a result, right, I physically etch it, right? I shoot them straight down. So the sidewalls are very vertical. Everything's nice and square, right? The problem is, is that because I'm using a physical process, right? If I were to grind it away, right? You kind of just grind everything pretty evenly, right? It doesn't really attack one more than the other. So if I want to make a really deep hole here, I'm going to have to have a really thick layer of polymer, which turns out that's kind of hard, right? It kind of gets difficult to do these thick layers. The second process, oh, is reactive ion etching. Okay, so we're going to back up. I forgot one thing. What kind of shape do you think a chemical process is going to make? A circle, right? A bowl shape, right? So if I have a bowl shape, right, I have this hole here, right? This is my polymer, and then this is my substrate down here, my silicon, right? So as I etch it away, I'm going to etch something like this, right? Right? And so originally, let's say this was, you know, my five nanometer wide feature, right? Now it's become even wider, right? So I can no longer control the shape as well, and it's going to actually enlarge my features. So if I want to make really small things, right, I'm not going to be able to etch it as deep. And so that kind of creates a problem. So that's what motivated the physical processes. And so this is why these chemical processes are not really the core technology anymore. We use them oftentimes to remove an entire layer, right? because they're very selective. It's a chemical reaction. It doesn't react with everything, only with some things. So we have this physical reaction. We said that's better for the direction, but it's not as selective. So the idea next is, OK, <coughs> what if we combine these two approaches? And this is the gold standard. It's called reactive ion etching. So instead of using argon, which we know is a noble gas, right? it's inert. It doesn't react with anything. We start using other chemicals that actually react with things. So one of the most popular is SF6. Um, this is used to etch silicon. And what happens is we ionize it, right? So we take this, this, this product here, and we split it into a positive ion and a negative ion. And then these negative ions can react with our silicon and create a byproduct. So later on in this class, you're going to be doing these sums of equation, especially with thermal properties. It's OK. It's OK. So later on, you guys will do these reactions, and you actually calculate the energy of the reaction. So you might be like, yeah, where does this matter? Where do we actually turn things into ions and stuff? And so this is an example of that. <laughs> and so as a result, we get a balance, right? We get better selectivity than the physical one, right? Because now it has a chemical component as well. And we don't get quite the same bowl shape here, right? Maybe instead it's something like here, right? And so then we can start to control our profile more while still not needing, you know, a super thick layer on the top. Now one extra way we can do this is called deep reactive ion etching, right? So if I want to go really deep, right? Let's say my profile, you know, just has a slight angle, you know? Maybe this is 10 degrees here, right? That's great until I try to get really deep, right? And then I would either get this shape or I would get something that's much wider, right? Something like this, right? So that's not exactly what we want. So what we do actually is we start this edge here. And then we deposit some polymer on the sides and the bottom everywhere, right? And then we etch again. And it's going to etch through all of this. And it's going to come down here. And it's also going to start etching away this polymer. So I get another one down here, right? So you can keep repeating this process. And this allows us to get very high aspect ratio is what we call it. So very tall structures that look like you know, skyscrapers. And this is what we can do on the chip. So we can make something that's really tall and super narrow. And that is really good, right? Because we want to pack these things super close together, right? But we can't make them so small that they don't, you know, can't hold any electricity. They don't have any electrons. So nowadays, we're making super tall structures that are super thin. Because the thickness is actually not that much, right? A few nanometers thick, you don't care about that, right? That'll fit in your phone no problem, right? 
But if I make a really wide chip, yeah, we can't put that in your phone anymore. So those are the advances that are going on now. So now we've gone through the fabrication process. You guys know now how to fabricate computer chips. You can add, pattern, and remove. And so we'll take you back. This was the original figure. So we did this pattern many, many times, and now we're back to these computer chips. So why does this matter? What else can you do? Well, I do some research, and I actually work on putting mechanical devices, devices that move, and optical devices, op devices that conduct light through them instead of electricity. So this is one. That, this is the device I work on. This device is about the thickness of a human hair. So the whole device here would fit inside one of your hairs. So that's what I work on. Um, other things you can build, like your gyroscope and your phone, things like that, accelerometers. You know, your phone can tell when you pick it up and down, which is kind of strange, right? There's actually a tiny little sensor inside that's moving around that's, you know, the size of a few hairs, right? We can also build the camera sensors and iPhone displays using the same technologies. And what all this means for you as well, when I was born in 2000, right, you can now fit hundreds of those computers onto a single iPhone, right? So in 20 years, we can take hundreds of computers and we can screen them down into one iPhone. We can also do things like, I don't know if you guys are, you guys might be too young for this now, but we used to have DVDs, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, right, you could t now take 400 DVDs and you can put them on one flash drive, right? So it's pretty incredible what we can do nowadays, and this continues to advance. You can imagine in the future what this will look like. So now I'll open it up for questions. Here's some extra advice. Um, I loved working at different companies. You guys don't know what you want to do, and that's okay. Go try things out, even if it's not your favorite job. Go see what it's like. Talk to people who do the job you like, want to do. Uh, please apply for scholarships. There's tons of free money out there. Most applications will take you an hour or two, and you can make you know $1,000. $500 an hour, not bad, guys, right? So get out there and apply, and just continue to explore topics you're interested in. So now I'll open it up for any questions you guys have. Yeah? Um, so when you like went to college like for this, is it like how do they like test you guys? Like when you have to do like tests, do they not like do kind of like, or, like would you like write your essay about? So I did undergrad, my, I actually started mechanical engineering, so I took classes on like material properties. Why is some things hard, why th some things bend, why are others brittle? So you have exams on that. It's a lot of math, I won't lie. Electrical engineering is a good amount of math, but it's fun math and it's interesting. I learned how to design a circuit. I deserved, learned about the physics of these materials and things like that. So a lot of that was my background. And then I went to grad school. I didn't know anything about how to make a computer chip even after undergrad. This is pretty much all things I've learned in grad school. There's definitely programs where you can learn this. And if you're interested, there's plenty of resources online. So um, yeah, what's up? So there's like prints. Mm-hmm. What made like that are like worth a billion dollars? Uh-huh. Why, why is that one like not used anymore? This one is $1,000, I would say. Um, it's not used because it was used for a specific research project, right? So he was, that person was making a specific design at a, simple at a specific time, right? Yeah. So like I am making this pattern right now, right? Yeah. If someone wants to make a switch or something different, they have no reason to use this pattern anymore. So these get recycled often. Um, yes, they are expensive. Um, that is a big part of the industry though, right? There's a huge market for cell phones, right? So when I make a computer, I make a wafer, right? I just made 640 computer chips, right? Each one of those goes to a cell phone. If I'm making millions of cell phones, I can just keep using that pattern over and over again. And that's the reason this research is really expensive is because, you know, if you want to make a one-off thing to try it out, you know, it's pretty expensive and that's why the industry is so big. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Very, very cool. very cool. If you guys have a question, ask a question before you guys have a question. Thank you. It's pretty one. Yes.